freezing cold, oppressive heat, devastating drought. Extreme climate change may have contributed to the extinction of the Neanderthals and allowed modern Homo sapiens to dominate the Earth. All life on Earth is subject to the power of climate. Civilizations evolve or vanish forever. Favourable climatic conditions support the rise of great empires and promote trade, prosperity and artistic achievement. Adverse climatic events often lead to war and other human catastrophes. The Earth, just before the birth of Christ. The stars were favourably aligned for life on our blue planet. For thousands of years, the Earth had been orbiting close to the Sun and receiving abundant light and heat. The Sun's scorching rays were tempered by the Earth's atmosphere, which cooled them to comfortable levels. As well as the plentiful sunshine, there was also regular rainfall. In northern Egypt, emma, an ancient form of wheat, grew in abundance. Much of this grain was also used by a European power to feed its empire. Rome was the centre of a vast empire. It's remembered for decadent luxury, grandiose architecture and the lavish spectacles that entertained its people. This extravagance was possible because of favourable climatic conditions. So if you look at climate and what is you could perceive as good climate, what you really want is enough water throughout the year so you can have agriculture, so you have enough drinking water, but also what you need is stability. So what you really want is the weather to be the same each year so you can plan. The growth rings of ancient oaks tell today's researchers that around 100 BC the weather was very stable and that temperatures were rising gradually. Average temperatures were about 2 degrees centigrade warmer than in previous centuries. For almost 300 years, climatic conditions were ideal for strong, stable growth. The small rise in temperature had a huge impact on the Northern Hemisphere, especially high in the mountains. Prior to this, the Alps had stopped the Roman Empire expanding northwards. But the higher temperatures caused glaciers to melt. Mountain passes were no longer covered in ice and snow, allowing Roman troops easy passage. Es ist deswegen vielleicht kein Zufall, dass sich das Römische Reich gerade in dieser Zeit in die nordalpinen Gebiete ausdehnt, also nach Germanien, nach Britannien. Da kann man auch wieder einen Zusammenhang mit dem Klima sehen. The Romans took advantage of the mild climate. Their troops crossed the Alps effortlessly and in large numbers. Nothing stood in the way of their conquest of Germania. Once over the Alps, their superior combat techniques made the Roman legions invincible. Region after region came under fire. The Germanic tribes didn't stand a chance. At the height of its power, the Roman Empire extended from Britain to the Caspian Sea and the Persian Gulf and had 50 million inhabitants. But the Romans weren't the only ones taking advantage of the climate. China was also experiencing a golden age. 
Along the Yangtze River, rice grew in abundance. The invention of agricultural irrigation systems improved people's living conditions, as did the use of draft animals. After numerous military campaigns, Qin Shi Huangdi united all the warring states under his rule in 221 BC. China became an empire. The Chinese emperor, like his Roman counterpart, pursued an expansionist policy. That made him enemies. The Qin Empire soon began work on the fortifications now known as the Great Wall of China. The wall was built of rammed earth and stone and was meant to protect the empire against hostile nomadic tribes in the north. The Romans used wood to build the walls that marked their imperial borders. The Limus Germanicus, which stretched for over 550 kilometres, controlled the flow of trade and defended the empire against enemy raids. All along the Limus were watchtowers manned with legionnaires. But that was not enough to protect Rome from a long series of battles with Germanic tribes. With its dense forests, the Germanian terrain proved a challenge for the Romans. And they weren't used to the heavy rainfall in these northern latitudes. In 9 AD, three Roman legions entered the Teutoburg forest. It had been raining for days and the ground was muddy. The dense undergrowth meant they couldn't march in combat formation. They walked straight into an ambush. The great thing about the actual Roman Empire was its standardization. It standardized the way people made roads, how the army marched and how they fought. The problem is that they were used to engage armies on sort of like a battlefield. However, when you're fighting in dense forest, in mud, with huge amounts of rainfall, suddenly all of that breaks down. So there's no organization. You're then fighting one on one. And that gave the Germanic tribes the edge because they were used to this running, hit and run battle approach in the dense forest. The Germanic attacker's fighting equipment was lighter and better suited for close combat. The Germanic tribes were very clever. They used the weather to their advantage to win the battle. They could fight in the forest in appalling conditions with huge amounts of rainfall and lots of mud. And they knew that that weather, that climate, would actually give them the advantage over the Romans who were used to working in teams and also in heavy armor and were using a large shield and a short stabbing sword. The legionnaires didn't stand a chance. The Battle of the Teutoburg Forest was the Romans' greatest defeat. They no longer believed in their own invincibility and never again attempted to conquer Germanic territory east of the Rhine. Das Römische Reich war in seiner Blütezeit riesig. Es hatte fast keine Gegner mehr zu bekämpfen. Aber langfristig sollte ein Gegner so stark sein, dass noch nicht mal die Römer dagegen siegen konnten. Und das war die Klimaveränderung. Climate change is influenced by astronomical forces. It depends on the Earth's orbit around the Sun, the tilt of the Earth's axis, and the level of solar activity, all of which vary. Sometimes the Earth's orbit is almost circular, at others more elliptical. One orbital cycle takes 100,000 years. During a 40,000 year cycle, the angle of the Earth's axis also changes. These variations cause regular changes in the Earth's climate, as the intensity of solar radiation increases and decreases. At about the time of Christ's birth, 
solar radiation probably decreased, the Gulf Stream cooled, and the Earth's climate became much colder. Crops died all across North Africa when the summer rains failed. Rome's granaries were empty. Climate change hit the empire at its most vulnerable point. If you look at the stresses of the Roman Empire and you look at whether it was the Republic or the Emperors, the one thing that they worried about was food. And you see many accounts of rioting in Rome when there wasn't enough food. If you're an emperor in charge of an empire, you have to remember only one thing. Unhappy people cause revolution. The people of Rome rebelled. For their rulers, the timing couldn't have been worse. The huge empire was already weakened by corruption and political discord. The outer reaches of the empire were also affected. Freezing cold winters led to hunger in many places. The northern provinces were worst hit. This bog mummy from northern Germany provides evidence of these extreme conditions. The adolescent's body was found by peat cutters in 1952 near the town of Winderby. Because of its slight build, the body was long thought to be that of a girl. But recent examination of the bones has revealed that they belong to a 14-year-old boy. They also tell us why he was so small. The arm and leg bones show evidence of years of poor nutrition. His growth was stunted, and in some years he didn't grow at all. For 12 of his 14 years, the boy was severely malnourished. It's likely that many others in Germania also went hungry, as the cold, unstable climate made living conditions more hostile. When invading Huns started to compete with Germanic tribes for the few remaining resources, they were forced to flee. A mass migration began. As they moved south, they displaced others. Soon, hundreds of thousands of climate refugees were slowly advancing on the Roman Empire. The harsh climate had at least one advantage. Frozen swamps and rivers were easy to cross and allowed the migrants to pass through Roman borders. Diese zugefrorene Flüsse waren für die Völkerwanderung eine ganz wesentliche Geschichte, weil die Reichsgrenze, die römische Reichsgrenze plötzlich einfach passierbar war. Vorher gab es nur Brücken und da saßen die römischen Legionen, konnten alles kontrollieren. In dem Augenblick, wo der Rhein zufriert, kann man einfach mit Zehntausenden von Menschen reinziehen ins römische Reich und genau das hat eben halt auch stattgefunden. In 406 AD, almost 90,000 people crossed the Rhine near Mainz and entered the Roman Empire. More and more tribes invaded, conquered and settled Roman territory. This spelled the end for the once powerful empire. As Europe entered the Middle Ages, the climate was still unstable particularly the spring of 536. The sun suddenly darkened and temperatures dropped. A Byzantine scholar reported that the sun gave forth its light without brightness and seemed like the sun in eclipse. According to Chinese sources, there were summer snows, drought and famine. Irish monks also reported crop failures. For a long time, the darkened sun remained a mystery. Today, though, most experts agree on what caused it. Wir bemerken das Klima eigentlich nur, wenn es sich abrupt verändert. Also zum Beispiel, wenn ein äh, großer Vulkanausbruch sich für einige Jahre auf das Klima auswirkt und es dadurch kälter wird. 
a cataclysmic event did take place in 536. The Ilopango volcano in what is now El Salvador erupted, leaving a caldera 17 kilometers wide and killing 100,000 people. Climatologist Robert Dull sees a connection between the eruption of Ilopango and the darkening of the sun that was observed at the time. He believes the volcano caused the climate crisis in the early Middle Ages. The volcano is basically the lake. What you see here is an outline of the entire area that was erupted all at once when this volcano erupted 1,500 years ago. The lake's dimensions suggest the size of the magma chamber at the time of the eruption. It's 270 metres deep, with walls over 400 metres high. It covers a total area of over 72 square kilometres. The eruption must have been immense. The dimensions of this vast crater are an indication that Ilopango could have been one of the world's few supervolcanoes. Robert Dull wants to prove that Ilopango was big enough to trigger climate change. To do that, he needs to analyse the volcanic ash, which can reveal a great deal about the eruption. The ash from Ilopango can still be found all around the lake. In some places, it forms towering cliffs. The colour of the ash holds the key. Ilopango ash is very light, an important fact according to Dull. The lighter the ash, the higher the silica content. Only high energy eruptions produce ash containing large quantities of silica. When we find an ash that's light in colour like this, it's very exciting for someone like me because what it tells us is that it's both high in silica and that it was erupted explosively in a geologic instant. It might have been a day, might have been two days, but a huge amount of material was erupted all at once, which tells us of the strength and magnitude and sheer immensity of this event. The greater a volcano's explosive forces, the more ash deposited in its immediate vicinity, and the further afield the ash is spread. Some of the Ilopango ash cliffs are up to 400 metres high. But Dull has found Ilopango ash a lot further afield. It formed hills, now overgrown by jungle. The origin of these hills is clear from the pumice stones Dull digs up. What we learn from these deposits is um, just the tip of the iceberg, really. Most of the material, by far, the far, the great majority of this material is outside of the caldera, not just on the margins of the caldera, but many hundreds of kilometers away. Ash from Ilopango is found not only in El Salvador, but also in Honduras, Nicaragua, and Guatemala, and at the bottom of the Pacific Ocean. Even core samples from the Arctic and Antarctic ice sheets contain ash from the 536 eruption. The amount of material that was erupted during the eruption of Ilopango was at least 84 cubic kilometres, a massive amount of rock thrown into the atmosphere at once. Some of that material would have blasted horizontally onto the landscape, but a large amount would have gone up through the lower atmosphere into the stratosphere. When that happens, the climate cools, which is exactly what happened after the Ilopango eruption. During the eruption, enormous quantities of ash and sulfur dioxide were propelled into the stratosphere.
For months, these fine particles floated at an altitude of 25 kilometers. Ilopango lies close to the equator. From there, winds carried the ash and sulfurous gases to both the North and South Poles. Within weeks, the blue planet was enveloped in a cloud of ash that blocked virtually all sunlight. What the ancient chroniclers observed was a volcanic winter. It lasted for 18 months and made the natural environment much more inhospitable. The ash cloud not only blocked the sun, but also brought cold and rain. It had a devastating effect on human populations. Harvests failed, stored food rotted, people were hungry and weak and succumbed easily to bubonic plague. The volcanic winter ended, but the plague did not. Millions of people fell ill. In the 14th century, over one third of Europe's population fell victim to the Black Death. Nature recovered more quickly than humans. After the volcanic winter, it reclaimed its territory. Only a few decades later, dense forests had grown across vast swathes of Europe. These forests were wild places where people only ventured to graze stock or collect wood. In the early Middle Ages, the forests were the home of wild animals. In them, wolves found shelter and room to roam. They were feared and hated as man-eating monsters. As were bears, another forest dweller. Der antike Mensch im römischen Germanien hatte die Natur fast beherrscht. Im frühen Mittelalter wird die Natur immer stärker und der Mensch fürchtet sich vor der Natur. Die Natur wird zur Bedrohung. Der Wald wird wieder bevölkert von Tieren, die in der römischen Zeit viel weniger verbreitet gewesen sind. Das sind vor allem Bär und Wolf, wahrscheinlich auch Wildkatze. Es ist gefährlich, in den Wald zu gehen. Der Mensch braucht aber den Wald, weil er seine Schweine zur Mast in den Eichenwald treibt. Sheep and goats also grazed in the forests. They were easy prey for hungry wolves. Forests became a symbol of an all-powerful nature, and fear became the overpowering emotion of the time. Da ist die Angst vor einer Welt, in der man nicht mehr leben kann. Da ist eine neue Ausrichtung hin zu Gott. Da ist eine größere Spiritualität. Itinerant monks from Ireland began preaching Christianity across Europe in the 6th century. It spread across the continent at the same time as forest and wilderness. Baptism gave believers the promise of a merciful God who would save their immortal souls. Such teachings gave people hope in difficult times. In China, Buddhism became established. The years of devastating drought after the Ilopango eruption contributed to the spread of Buddhist teachings. Starving farmers found comfort in the possibility of being reborn into a more prosperous and happier life. Islam spread through conquest. According to some experts, Muslims began their military campaigns after a long drought on the Arabian Peninsula. In the 8th century, Islam came to Spain. But climatic conditions did not deteriorate everywhere on Earth. Weather patterns around the equator were almost perfect. Regular monsoon rains drenched the fertile soil. 
these ideal conditions saw the rise of prosperous and powerful kingdoms. In Central America, the Mayans built new cities. Many of them were home to over 10,000 people. In Peru, the Nazca civilization was based on the cultivation of corn, manioc and sweet potato. They created huge geoglyphs, which may have been intended to thank their gods for plentiful harvests. Then the monsoons failed. Fields became deserts. The Nazca drew even larger pictures in the earth, perhaps hoping to appease the gods. Other places also became drier. The Mayans also felt the effects of a changing climate. Around 900 AD, they abandoned their great cities. Prolonged drought threatened their culture. The Nazca were also struggling to survive. There's speculation that they became climate refugees, moving higher into the Andes. Astronomers now have an explanation as to why the climate became so warm and dry at this time. The reason was solar activity. The sun continuously produces vast amounts of energy, which are released on its surface in the form of solar flares and geomagnetic storms. This heat energy affects the amount of solar radiation that reaches the Earth. This radiation is strong at some times and weaker at others. This is because solar activity is always fluctuating. Dark patches on the sun's surface indicate how much energy is being produced. The more patches, the higher the solar activity. The number of sunspots peaks every 11 years. Such a peak occurred in 800 AD. Solar activity was at maximum levels and solar radiation particularly intense. The Earth began to heat up. The North Atlantic, which had been covered in solid pack ice, became navigable all year round. A thaw set in from the Arctic to the European mainland, opening the way for seaborne invaders. The Vikings reached Britain at the end of the 8th century. They came to plunder. With their attack on Lindisfarne Priory in northern England, the Vikings stormed into history. Soon they were feared all across Europe as bloodthirsty raiders. But the Vikings were also pioneers and explorers. The mild climate allowed them to sail west across the North Atlantic. The Vikings, when they went exploring, were taking advantage of the medieval warm period. And during this warm period, the Gulf Stream was actually coming much further north, and giving much more warmth to Western Europe. But it also what it allowed was the retreat of sea ice. So the sea ice that usually comes to at least Iceland during the winter was much further to the north, which allowed the Vikings to not only sail all the way around to um, Mediterranean and to exchange uh, goods with the civilizations there. It also then encouraged the uh, exploration of the rest of the world. Wherever melting snow and ice had uncovered virgin soils, the Vikings settled. First, they discovered Iceland. At the time, it was almost ice-free and uninhabited. In 985, the Viking seafarers reached the next milestone in their westward expansion, Greenland. They built large settlements along the coasts and rivers. The 
because of that warmer climate, you could actually grow crops. So all the agriculture from Scandinavia, they could literally just transport and take to Iceland and to Greenland. The warmer weather allowed the Norsemen to make another, even bolder voyage of discovery right across the Atlantic. Around 1000 AD, Leif Erikson reached Newfoundland, almost 500 years before the voyage of Christopher Columbus. Meanwhile, temperatures in Europe continued to rise as the increased solar activity continued. The landscape became a sea of colour as temperatures rose. Forests began to grow at altitudes above 2,000 metres. Grain and other crops could be grown even at high altitudes. The dark years of hardship and hunger were over. Conditions for agriculture were the best they'd been for centuries. Farmers began using new technology to increase their yields. Knowledge of the harness spread from Asia to Europe. It allowed horses to pull more weight and till larger fields. The seasons were reliable. Spring, summer, autumn and winter came and went in a predictable pattern. The first weather forecasts were folk sayings based on farmers' observations of the seasons. Das Schlimmste, was passieren kann, ist, dass wir jedes Jahr was anderes haben. Aber wenn das Wetter einigermaßen stabil ist, dann kann man von einem Jahr aufs nächste Jahr planen und dann kann man sich entwickeln. Agriculture became more intensive. One field was left fallow. One was used for legumes and another for grain. This three-field system was far more productive. Farmers were able to produce more than they needed, so they could trade their surplus produce. They took it to the markets in nearby towns. Demand increased, and new products were offered for sale. More and more merchants set up businesses. Village marketplaces grew into flourishing towns and cities. This set the scene for the emergence of a new social order, consisting of free citizens and wealthy merchants. The entstehung des Städtewesens als Antwort auf einen Klimawandel liefern die Initialzündung für ein Take-off der Menschheitsgeschichte, für ein Explodieren von Kultur und Zivilisation. Und damit ist der Grundstein gelegt für das Entstehen der modernen Welt für unsere Welt. Amsterdam, Warsaw, Freiburg, Leipzig, The Hague. Three quarters of Europe's cities arose during the favourable climatic conditions of the High Middle Ages. Venice, with its colonial empire and vast trade network, was Europe's source for goods from many foreign lands. It wasn't long before Western Europe began to use coins. First ones that were valued by weight, and later the standard silver denarius. Increasing prosperity created the foundation for education, the arts and culture. Europe's first universities were founded in Bologna, Paris and Oxford. The moderate climate inspired a new architectural style. Gothic churches had large windows to let the sun in. Construction of Cologne Cathedral began in 1248. 
slim arches and stained glass windows dominate the soaring presbytery. These allow light to flood the interior of the cathedral. This extraordinary building is the manifestation of a confident and optimistic society. By 1250, kingdoms had been established all over Europe. The Holy Roman Empire expanded. It conquered Sicily and was bigger than ever before. But then, everything changed. Once again, climate was to make history. In the second half of the 13th century, Europe cooled significantly. The trigger for this was a number of volcanic eruptions in different parts of the world. Most of them were located along the world's largest volcanic belt, the Pacific Ring of Fire. First to erupt, in 1257, was Somalis Volcano in Indonesia. Then Sicily's Mount Etna spewed fire. In 1453, the Kuwe Volcano in Vanuatu exploded violently. Finally, the Laki Fischer in Iceland erupted continuously for eight months. It's estimated to have been one of the deadliest eruptions in history. All these eruptions spewed ash and sulphur dioxide into the stratosphere. They affected the world's climate for almost 500 years. The mid-13th century marked the start of the longest cold period since the end of the Ice Age, more than 10,000 years before. In Europe, the effects of this little Ice Age were described by monks, town scribes and chroniclers in thousands of documents. Climatologist Rudiger Glaser has studied these historical sources. They describe vividly the devastating consequences of periods of extreme cold, as well as other natural disasters. These illustrated broadsheets from Flanders depict floods that hit Central Europe on an unprecedented scale in 1342. Thousands perished in what was known as St Mary Magdalene's Flood. In 1342 was the hydrologic GAU, the largest hochwasser of the last thousand years mit verheerenden Folgen. Es waren damals alle Brücken weggerissen worden. Es sind ganze Hangpartien abgerutscht. Und selbst unter Wald, wo man einfach so eine gewisse Schutzwirkung normalerweise erkennen kann, gab es Schluchtenreisen. Haben sich also kleine, nichtssagende Bächlein zu tiefen Schluchten vertieft und erweitert. There were destructive floods from Cologne to Vienna, from the Rhine to the Danube. In Frankfurt, the Main River rose to almost eight metres. Along the Danube alone, over 6,000 people drowned. But the chroniclers didn't only record catastrophic floods. In the summer of 1586, the citizens of Ghent feared for their lives. A ferocious storm struck the city. People and even buildings were washed away. The terrified populace believed that demonic forces were at work. But the terrifying tempest of August 1586 was not caused by demons. Es zeigen sich dämonische Gestalten, die Häuser und Personen emporreißen. 
sodass der Verdacht sehr nahe liegt, dass das hier sogar ein Tornado ist, der abgebildet wurde. Evidence suggests it was a tornado that tore through Ghent. The storm had long-term effects on the city's inhabitants, because essential structures had been destroyed. Man hat oft ein, zwei Generationen gebraucht, um die Schäden von solchen Großereignissen wieder zu kompensieren, die Brücken wieder zu bauen, die Mühlen wieder zu bauen, die Wehre einzurichten. People believed that God was punishing them by sending all these natural disasters. During the 500 years of the Little Ice Age, unstable climatic conditions made life a daily struggle for survival. Und sie waren in der Tat in jeder Generation von Witterungsextremen und von Unwettern und von Klimakatastrophen betroffen. Und das hat natürlich die Menschen tief beeindruckt. Und sie haben tatsächlich dann das Gefühl gehabt, Doomsday, Weltuntergang ist angesagt. But it was not only extreme weather events that caused suffering. The key problem with the Little Ice Age is the actual cold conditions. After the population growth of the medieval warm period, where there seemed to be abundant food for this growing population, the Little Ice Age had a huge effect. The growing season for crops was much shorter and the climate was much colder. And so you find that as the Little Ice Age uh, starts, you get famine throughout Western Europe. It had a profound effect on human society and there were lots and lots of deaths through starvation. Records show that sometimes everything just stopped. This happened in the German town of Augsburg in 1658. Das Monat Sena und Februar hat es so hart geschneit und gewehet, dass man nicht hat wandeln können, desgleichen alle Mahlmühlen, Hammer- und Sägmühlen eingefroren sind, dass man lange Zeit nicht hat arbeiten können. Not only were summers too cold for good harvests, but also much too wet. Continual rain caused seeds and crops to go mouldy and spoil. Famine killed many and weakened those who survived. They succumbed quickly when the plague returned. Europe's population had soared during the High Middle Ages, but now it fell by one third in just one century. Desperate people sought an explanation for their misery. Keine Eiszeit hat sich für viele Menschen als eine ausgesprochene Zeit der Krise dargestellt. In der Krise haben sie häufig einen wirtschaftlichen Schaden. Und wenn sie einen wirtschaftlichen Schaden erleiden und die Mechanismen nicht erkennen, dann suchen sie einen Schuldigen. In der kleinen Eiszeit ist es kein Zufall, dass man gerade zu dieser Zeit eine viel stärkere Hexenverfolgung hat, die insofern in einem ursächlichen Zusammenhang zum Klimawandel steht. The witch hunts targeted people on the margins of society. Many of those accused of having made a pact with the devil were lower class, elderly and female. Wir wissen das äh, zum Leider aus den Folterprotokollen. Da wurden die Armen dann äh, unter der Folter halt gefragt, wie sie das Unwetter gemacht haben. Also wie haben sie jetzt den Hagelschlag äh, herbeigeführt, der die Reben zerschlagen hat? Wie das Unwetter gemacht? Wie die Überschwemmung? hervorgerufen und unter der Folter haben die leider dann halt die Sachen, die ihnen vorgeworfen wurden, auch bekannt und damit war man sozusagen gefestigt und war der Überzeugung, dass sie halt auch die Ursache waren und die Übeltäter und Übeltäterinnen mit allen grausamen Konsequenzen der Hexenverbrennung und der Tötung. During the witch hunt sparked by the Little Ice Age, around 60,000 innocent people were burned at the stake. But the weather didn't change. Temperatures continued to drop. Glaciers advanced all across North America and Europe. Many people abandoned villages and farms in the mountains because of avalanches, landslides and glacial ice. Near the town of Chamonix in the French Alps, for example, glaciers engulfed whole villages. 
Elsewhere, they cut off important supply routes. In Greenland and Iceland too, massive glaciers were encroaching. The ongoing climate crisis was reflected in the political climate. Unrest spread throughout Europe. The second defenestration of Prague caused the collapse of the uneasy peace between the European powers and marked the beginning of the Thirty Years' War. Soon, most of Europe was involved. The war was mostly fought within the Holy Roman Empire. In some places, up to two-thirds of the population died, and not just on the battlefields. Most casualties were civilians. Woran sterben denn die Leute, wenn man sich die damaligen Waffen anschaut? Also diese Gewehre, Musketen, die waren ja oft äh, gefährlicher für den, der damit rumgespielt hat, als für den Feind. Und äh, die großen Todeszahlen, auf die wir eigentlich kommen, die äh, kommen meistens durch äh, Epidemien, durch Seuchen zustande. Also es gibt große äh, Pestepidemien, es gibt Typhusepidemien, es gibt Pocken, oft auch in Kombination äh, miteinander oder mit anderen Krankheiten, Erkältungskrankheiten. Und äh, das sind sozusagen die äh, Ereignisse, die äh, ganz, äh, halbe Städte sterben lassen. Es ist nicht der Krieg, der zu diesen großen Todeszahlen führt, sondern es ist eigentlich die Klimaungunst dieser Jahre. In France, cold, damp weather caused repeated crop failures. In Paris, the price of bread and other staples soared. The situation soon escalated. Die Menschen werden nicht mehr so stabil versorgt. Periodische Hungersnöte sind an der Tagesordnung und die Lebenserwartung sinkt rapide. The well-fed members of the aristocracy were far removed from the concerns of their people. By the time the nobility realized how explosive the situation had become because of this lack of basic supplies, it was too late. Das Klima kann für politische Systeme oder auch für einzelne Machthaber eine unglaubliche Herausforderung sein, wo wir Missernten haben, wo wir ungünstige klimatische Veränderungen haben. Da verliert Bevölkerung das Vertrauen zu den Herrschern und es kommt zur Revolution. Das französische Königshaus musste 1789 diese Erfahrung ganz besonders bitter machen. On the 14th of July 1789, Paris reached boiling point. Armed citizens stormed the Bastille. The guards were forced to capitulate. The attack marked the start of the French Revolution. In the years to come, the royal family and many other members of the nobility were executed by guillotine. The French people overthrew the monarchy and democracy returned to Europe for the first time in 2,000 years. One slogan from the French Revolution was liberty, equality and fraternity, now France's national motto. In 1815, the Little Ice Age entered a final dark phase, triggered by another geological disaster. Indonesia's Mount Tambora erupted. The massive explosion ejected almost twice as much material as Ilopango in 536, including vast clouds of fine ash that remained in the atmosphere for months. There was a, a large fraction that went straight up into the upper atmosphere. That ash worked its way around the globe uh, in the upper atmosphere as a dust veil, and that dust veil reflected the sun's uh, radiation uh, in a way that would cause climate cooling. 1816 was a year without a summer all over the planet. Unseasonal frost and snow caused crop failures and disastrous famines in Europe. In Germany, hunger triggered the first of three great 19th century waves of migration. Thousands left Hamburg and crossed the Atlantic to America. Finally, 
finally, the cold eased. In about 1850, a warm phase began, bringing stable, moderate temperatures. It has shaped our climate ever since. Just before this warm period began, humans embarked on a time of dramatic technological and social change. The Industrial Revolution heralded the age of machines. Ever since, technological progress has brought prosperity to industrial nations. But it has also caused human-induced climate change on an alarming and unprecedented scale. Natural disasters are nature's way of sounding the alarm bell. Our planet has heated up and is struggling to cope with global warming. For some time, scientists have been asking us to acknowledge these signs and change course. We are at that point where we can decide what sort of climate we want to have in the future. If we as a collective in the world, all the nations actually reduce climate change, that would be amazing. Because what it means is for the first time, instead of climate controlling us, our global society has decided we are going to control the climate and we are going to make sure that we have a stable climate for all future generations. All climate change affects life on Earth. Climate makes history. It always has done and it always will.